It was a warm March evening in Cocoa Beach, Florida on March 20th, 1994. 21-year-old Amy Gellert drove home from church unaware that a masked intruder had broken into her family's home. As she pulled into the driveway, the intruder viciously attacked Amy's mother and stepfather with a dagger before fleeing the house where he encountered Amy in the driveway. He slashed and stabbed Amy before disappearing into the night. Bleeding and mortally wounded, Amy stumbled across the street into the parking lot of an apartment building where she died just minutes later. Welcome to Bitter Endings, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, J.R. Erickson. In Bitter Endings, I'll bring you stories of those taken too soon, the silent many who no longer have a voice through which to seek justice. The Bitter Endings podcast is sponsored by my fiction novels, The Northern Michigan Asylum series are novels that braid elements of haunting and murder mystery, and they're all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com in audio format if you are an Audible listener, as well as in ebook and paperback. Cocoa Beach is a beach town in Brevard County, Florida, located on the eastern side of the state on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. In 1994, the population was around 12,000 people, which swelled during spring breaks and major events like surfing competitions. It's a mecca for the sun-seeking vacationers, those looking for palm tree-lined streets and surfers trying to find their next wave. However, for Amy Gellert, Cocoa Beach was home. She lived with her mother, Bunny, and her stepfather, Bob Layton, in a suburban home situated on the inland Banana River, a 31-mile stretch of lagoon that runs from Cape Canaveral to Merritt Island. Charlotte Amy Geller, known to family and friends as Amy, was born February 22, 1973, to her mother, who was also named Charlotte but went by Bunny, and her father, Daniel Geller. Amy's parents divorced when she was three years old, and Amy's mom got remarried to Bob Layton when she was five. As a child, Amy developed encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. She was gravely ill but recovered. However, the illness left her with learning disabilities, and she ended up being held back for a year in school. She had two older brothers, Mark and Ryan, whom she adored and who were crazy about her in return. She was not a little princess, but instead described by friends and family as a tomboy and later a punk rock girl who loved to have fun and was up for anything. One family friend told a story of Amy dressed in a cape and cowboy boots, jumping off the furniture and playing as if she were a superhero. She was a climber of trees, a lover of animals, and a person who many considered a friend. One of Amy's elementary school friends remembered running with her on the playground at Freedom Elementary in Cocoa Beach, where they attended school. They'd grab sheets of thin bark from the trees they called paper trees that dotted the grassy ground. She often hung out at the skate park where her friends and brothers perfected their skateboarding tricks. Amy was happy, filled with laughter. She liked alternative things, while other girls her age were crooning to pop stars like the Bangles and Tiffany. Amy liked Nine Inch Nails and musicians operating on the fringe. Her friend James described her as an old soul. Andrea O'Dell, Amy's best friend since freshman year in high school, said Amy just had a presence about her. She was adventurous. She went skydiving. Her brother described her as the perfect sister and friend. Bunny Layton said her daughter was loving and vibrant, a sister and a friend, and far more than just a victim of a brutal crime. But it wasn't all sunshine in Amy Gellert's life. 
In her teen years, Amy started dabbling in drugs, specifically smoking pot. Unfortunately, Amy's use surpassed the occasional getting stoned on the weekend practiced by most young people and turned into a regular habit that led to conflict in her home life. Bunny put Amy into an intense rehab program called Straight Incorporated. She didn't go by choice, and she blamed Bunny. The issue of drug use is always a point of frustration for me when researching true crime cases. A lot of teens get high. In reality, at this point, more and more states are legalizing the sale and use of marijuana. And yet, it still seems to hold this stigma whenever we're talking about a murder victim, as if this one thing that most of us tried at some point led to their death. So on the one hand, I almost want to leave it out so as not to bias the person listening to this against the victim. But we can't because unfortunately in Amy's case, the marijuana use led to a rehab center, which led to acquaintances who were shady and in an unsolved murder, you can't exactly rule out the shady characters. I also just wanna make a quick aside about Straight Incorporated. When I looked up this drug rehab company, the results clearly indicated that this place was more than tough. There's an entire website called Surviving Straight about people who were victimized during their recovery. In 1989, the Texas Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse released a statement that said, quote, Clients were tied up with rope and towing straps to prevent escape, and bedrooms were overcrowded and furnished with containers to be used for urination. The company was the focus of multiple claims of abuse and paid undisclosed financial settlements to more than one patient who claimed they'd been abused at the straight facilities. Now, whether or not this is related to Amy's death is impossible to say, but one thing is certain. She became friends with a man at Straight who wasn't just smoking pot. He was a heavy cocaine user who'd been in and out of rehabs and was known by many to be a con artist. He's also one of the prime suspects in her murder, but we'll get to that later. Amy returned home from rehab in 1992. She had a better head on her shoulders and was focused on the future. She'd also made new friends at the church she attended and got involved with their music program. Amy had a lifelong love of music. Her mother joked that she had dreamed of being a roadie for a rock and roll band and instead ended up as a roadie for Calvary Chapel's rock and roll Christian praise band. She'd been learning and sort of interning as a sound engineer for the church. Her pastor remembered that Amy had an ear, a natural ability to work with music, and she also had a bit of a radical side, which he liked. At the time of her death, she was helping record a woman's first album with the church's record label. The woman, Mary Barrett, would write a song about Amy after her death called A Breath Away, with lyrics, quote, Late last night, we waved goodbye one last time. In the days leading up to her murder, spring break crowds swarmed the beach. Her older brother, Ryan, was home from college and Amy seemed to be in a good place in her life. Bunny said she had no premonitions that something terrible awaited them. So let's slip back in time. 26 years gone by to a warm night on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. It's Sunday, March 20th, 1994, and going on 9 p.m. when Amy finishes up at church and drives home. Dark has already fallen when she pulls into the driveway. Unbeknownst to Amy, a terrifying assault is occurring behind the closed doors of her home. The attack began a half hour before when Bunny and Bob Layton returned from church. They walked into their suburban home to find a masked intruder carrying a gun and a dagger. The following 30 minutes unfolded slowly and strangely for Bob and Bunny. The intruder was friendly at first, telling the Laytons he was a burglar and he wouldn't hurt them if they did what he said. He explained that he'd walked in through an unlocked glass door and they should be more careful about their home security. He said, quote, I don't want you to see my face. That would be bad. He also asked them who else lived at the residence. 
Bunny explained that she and her husband and her daughter lived there. Bob described the man's voice as a little higher than a typical man's voice, and he didn't use profanity. Bunny said the intruder had a mid-Atlantic accent, possibly someone who was from Pennsylvania or Maryland. He asked the Laytons what money they had. Robert had 50 or $60 in his wallet, which he gave him. The man paced around the room, mentioning that he was waiting for a ride and asking repeatedly when their daughter would be home. Bob told the man they had two cars in the garage. They'd happily give him the keys so he could leave. The intruder asked if their cars were stick shifts, and when the Laytons said they were, he didn't ask more about their vehicles and resumed his pacing. Bob tried to figure out a way to defuse the situation without anyone getting hurt. He told the man he and Bunny could go stand on their dock, which stretched into the Banana River. That way they couldn't escape and he could see them. He ignored the suggestion but continued pacing, repeating that his ride would be there soon. However, as the minutes ticked by, he grew more and more agitated. At some point, he forced Bob to lie on the floor on his belly. He made Bunny lie horizontally across Bob's back, which trapped Bob. The intruder then kneeled on Bunny's back. When headlights appeared in the driveway, the man who'd been growing more and more anxious went into a full-blown panic. He began pricking Bunny in the scalp with his dagger over and over again. She was crying out, saying that it hurt. But as his panic increased, he slashed her across the throat and then stabbed her in the back. He then started to stab her in the neck. In an interview with 48 Hours, Bunny said she can still remember the sounds of bones crunching as he stabbed her in the neck. He attacked Bob with the dagger as well, stabbing him in the back of the head. Bob, knowing their only hope of survival was to get out of the house, raced out the front door. The intruder followed him, and he encountered Amy, who was standing behind her car. He stabbed and slashed her and then ran in the direction of the beach, disappearing into the night. Bleeding, Amy staggered across the road where two people were sitting in a car in the parking lot of an apartment complex. She collapsed and died as they called the police. When detectives arrived, they were greeted by a gruesome sight. Both the driveway and parts of the home's interior were splattered with blood. Amy's backpack had been dropped behind her car. It was marred with slash marks as if she'd held it up in an attempt to defend herself. There was little evidence at the scene to point to a killer. They did find the magazine from his gun. Bunny and Bob were not aware that Amy had even been injured. It wasn't until a pastor arrived at the hospital and told Bunny that Amy didn't make it that they realized the intruder had attacked their daughter and murdered her. As detectives interviewed Bunny and Bob, they started to piece together the crime, and they believed the case was solvable. They assumed they would narrow down a suspect and the person would ultimately confess. It turned out to be just the opposite. So let's talk about the evidence, because this is one of the things. I watched a 48 Hours mystery, which I'll link to in the show notes, and it's clear that there is a decent amount of evidence in this case, and it does feel like a solvable case. So the hope is that someone somewhere is going to come across this information and, and make the connection. So this is the evidence. What we know about the intruder. The intruder was a white man of average height and build, probably in his 20s. So today he would be in his 40s or possibly his 50s. He has a slightly high voice, a mid-Atlantic accent, which means he's likely from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, New York, New Jersey, or some other state in that northern East Coast region. He wore a dark ski mask and dark, long-sleeved clothing, as well as dark gloves with leather on the palms, which is a point to note because this was spring break in Florida. 
Most spring breakers aren't bringing those items with them, which implies this is someone who lives in the area. Except ski masks are not typical Florida attire, so maybe it's someone who lived up north and moved down south. He also wore white tennis shoes. He probably could not drive a stick shift car since they offered him their vehicles to escape, and his question was whether or not they were stick shifts. When he found out they were, he didn't ask any more about their cars. He was polite, even sweet initially, is how Bob described him, and he didn't use profanity, which implies a certain level of education and social skills. He described himself as a burglar, so this likely wasn't his first time breaking into a house. He carried a dagger, which the Leightons said had an ornate hilt. Bob described it as having a gold chain design around the top of the handle. So again, not a usual weapon, something that is decorative, maybe someone who collects knives or daggers. He also carried a gun, which police learned after they investigated the magazine was not a real gun at all, but a prop gun designed by the company Brixia. Their guns fire blanks and are used in films and theater productions. So a person who is somehow affiliated with the film industry, with the theater industry, and the dagger could even be associated with that then. Another revealing aspect to the crime was the way the intruder asked Bunny to lay over Bob. Investigators said it was a technique taught in military or law enforcement academies, so the man likely had some kind of military or security training. Despite a lack of forensic evidence in the murder of Amy Gellert, the police have developed several suspects over the years, and I'm going to go into those suspects now. So the, fir the first on the list is a person named Jeffrey Anderson. He's a burglar serving time in prison. And on the day after Amy was murdered, Jeffrey was involved in a police chase in a stolen car. When they arrested Jeffrey, they noticed that there were books about homicide in the back seat of his car. The real reason that police were interested in him was because Bunny's credit cards were found on the side of the road, somewhat in the vicinity to where this police chase happened. So they assumed he might have thrown the cards from the car as he was running from police. Anderson ended up passing a polygraph test, and though he has not been released as a suspect, they don't really consider him a prime suspect in the case. The next suspect on the list by investigators is a man named Hugh Popple. And Hugh Popple was a friend of Amy's and even someone she was romantically involved with. They'd gone to school together, and he didn't actually become a suspect in her murder until 2013, after he had been killed in a hit-and-run accident. Someone at a party apparently made a comment that his death was karma for what he did to Amy Geller. So police did look into Popple as possibly being involved, but again, they were not able to substantiate any claims of his involvement. Amy's friend described Hugh as a troubled individual. He was a punk rocker, he was self-destructive, he might have cut himself, and he had problems with drugs and alcohol. There was also a rumor that he liked to use knives and he had a propensity for violence. I did try to look up information on Hugh and I, I really didn't find anything much more than that. The next suspect, and a significantly better suspect in the eyes of police, is a man named Dominic Kanuka.
At the time of Amy's death, he was a 22-year-old short order cook in the Cocoa Beach area. He was working at a restaurant called Gatsby's, and he had just moved to Cocoa Beach with his high school girlfriend from Pennsylvania. He wasn't a suspect until a year after the murder. And basically what happened is someone contacted police with a tip that they had overheard Dominic's girlfriend, Julie, talking about how he might have been involved in the crime. At the time of the murder, Dominic was AWOL from the Marines, so he did have military background. And his military records revealed that he had high anxiety and he was prone to explosive violence. One day after Amy's murder, Dominic stole a car and fled back to Pennsylvania. So when investigators caught up with him later on, he was in prison for robbing a pharmacy. He had been armed with a BB gun and wearing a black fedora and dark glasses. When they questioned him about Amy's murder, he told them a story that made them even more suspicious of him. He put himself at the scene on the night of her murder. He claimed that he'd been coming home from work when he passed Amy's house and saw the police lights and the commotion. He pulled over to see what was going on and ended up assisting a deputy in putting up crime scene tape. The police were immediately suspect about this story, and their suspicions only amplified when they went to Gatsby's, where he worked as a cook, and looked at the time card for March 20th, and Dominic did not work at the restaurant that night. The other things that they were curious about with Dominic was obviously that he was from Pennsylvania, so he would have an accent that would line up with the accent described by Bunny and Bob. He'd also only been in the area for a couple of months, so he would be more likely to have cold weather gear. And he fled the day after her murder, not to mention that he put himself at the scene of the crime. He was given a polygraph and he failed it. Unfortunately, there was no other evidence that connected him to her murder. Police did go and interview Julie, who in 1994 said she had no memory of making a statement implying that Dominic had been involved in the murder. And years later, police went back and interviewed Julie a second time and Again, she said she had no recollection of ever making that statement. She did say that Dominic owned knives and that he could he could be volatile. He could be nice and he could also be mean. That brings us to the final suspect and who is considered by police to be the main suspect in the case and also the person that I alluded to earlier when I spoke about an acquaintance that Amy met during her time at the rehab facility Straight Incorporated. We're talking about a man named Scott Manley. On the evening of March 20th, Scott stopped by Amy's house before she left for church. He told police later that they had plans to go out that evening. Scott was known as a handsome bad boy. He was two and a half years older than Amy, considered a con artist, and he had a serious cocaine addiction. They met at Strait and Scott also happened to be from Cocoa Beach, Florida. So they remained in contact after they both left the rehab. And after Scott left the rehab that he was in with Amy, he was in additional rehabs in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And by the time he was back in Cocoa Beach in March of 94, he was again using hard drugs specifically crack cocaine. So he showed up the morning after Amy's murder at the police station. 
and he arrived because he wanted to explain why he'd left a voicemail at her home the day before. And police had listened to the voicemail. It had come in around 9.30 p.m., which was about 25 minutes after Amy was stabbed. And the voicemail just said that it was too late for them to go out and he'd get in touch with her later. So the police would not have initially thought much about this message on the answering machine, except that Scott appeared at the police station the following day to explain why he'd left it. So then the police asked what was his alibi for the night before. And Scott told them that he had gone to visit a friend from AA, except when the police followed up with the friend, they found out that Scott had been lying and he had not gone to visit the friend. So then they wanted to know more about his whereabouts. Scott ended up admitting that he was out driving around looking for crack cocaine, but he was at home in the apartment that he shared with his parents by 9 p.m. And they ended up confirming this alibi. They also found out that Scott, who had claimed to be stopping by before Amy went to church to pay her $30 that he owed her, had not actually given her any money. He'd asked his dad for the $30, His dad had given him the money and even driven him to Amy's house to deliver it, but then Scott simply pocketed the money so that he could use it later to buy drugs. So one of the things that makes him a suspect is that he, one, he lied to the police, obviously, but he was also the last person with Amy at her house before she went to church. So he knew that she was leaving. He had a drug problem. Is it possible that he or he and an accomplice went back to the house thinking that it would be empty and they could burglarize it? Now, one issue that I have with this theory is that he would have had a pretty good idea of when Amy was going to get home from church. And at the very least, he wouldn't think he would have an indefinite amount of time. One thing that the police have really looked for in the suspects is a link between Scott Manley and Dominic Kanuka. And the reason they have looked for that link is because Dominic fit the profile of the man who would have been in the house, and Scott fit the profile of a potential accomplice, someone who would have known the house, who would have known that it was empty, who might have believed there was money in the house. And even though Scott had an alibi after 9 p.m., the burglar who was in the house was likely dropped off there before Bunny and Bob returned from church, and his ride was supposed to come back to get him, but never did. So what if, and this is not at all based on evidence, this is me following that thread, what if Dominic and Scott were in this together, and Scott drove Dominic to the house, dropped him off, said, I'll be back in 20 minutes to pick you up, And while he's waiting down the road, he sees Amy's parents pull into the driveway and into the garage. And so now he panics and he goes home. He goes back to his parents' house and he leaves Dominic there. And the police were really not able to find a link between these two men. But they did say Dominic worked as a cook at a restaurant called Gatsby's and Scott Manley interviewed for a job at that restaurant. And there was a woman there who thought she remembered a person fitting Scott's description who once came in looking for Dominic. So it 
it is possible. This isn't a huge town of people. Cocoa Beach is not a giant place. And these are both men who are using drugs, who are kind of walking on the dark side a little bit. It's not a huge stretch to imagine they might have met. And the other thing that I thought was interesting was that Dominic was from Pennsylvania and he moved to Cocoa Beach just a couple months before the murder and Scott had been in a rehab facility in Pennsylvania. So I, I have no idea if there's any way they could have met during that period of time, but I thought that was one potential connection there. Police also acknowledge the possibility that this this was random and the perpetrators did not know Amy, did not know her family. I should also mention in the 48 hours interview, they seem to be leaning heavily towards the idea that Amy was the target of this murder. And their explanation of that was largely that the intruder, rather than fleeing the scene and running away, and rather than killing Bunny and Bob right away and running away, he stayed in the house until Amy got home, almost as if he were waiting for her so that he could attack and kill her. I will say after everything that I read about the case, which, mind you, is going to be a lot less than the police have in their evidence files, my sense really was that this was a burglary gone wrong. It's totally possible that whoever was robbing the Leighton house did know Amy, but I don't think the person who walked into the house intended to kill anyone. I think they intended to go in and rob it. I think Bunny and Bob arrived home while they were there. I think the accomplice who was driving the car panicked and drove away and left the intruder in the house. And I think that the intruder in the house just got more and more agitated and scared and anxious when his ride did not reappear. And he reached the point when Amy arrived home where he was like an animal backed into a corner and he lashed out and he tried not to leave any witnesses. It's totally irrational. You have a mask on, why wouldn't you just run out the door and try to get away? You're essentially doing the same thing, except now you're leaving a trail of bodies in your wake and you're seriously increasing the likelihood of you know, forensic evidence being passed between you. Let's also talk about the, the forensic situation. So although they consider Scott a prime suspect, his parents, verified that he was home by 9 p.m. If he had climbed into his car after stabbing Bunny and Bob and murdering Amy, it's nearly impossible that he would not have transferred some of that blood into his car, into his home. Police found no forensic evidence whatsoever connecting Scott to that crime scene. That doesn't mean that Again, it couldn't have been Dominic that, that was at the crime scene. We, Since they didn't start looking at Dominic until a year after the murder, by the time they were questioning him and questioning other people about him, I think his whereabouts on that night would probably have been a lot more hazy. He did put himself at the crime, though, and he wasn't at work. So there's there's definitely some strong evidence pointing to him. There was also DNA found on the magazine clip that had fallen out of the gun, and that DNA has not matched any of the suspects that the police have considered in the murder of Amy Geller. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the DNA on the gun belongs to the killer. It's possible that it belongs to whoever owned the gun before. It might have been used in a movie or a television show or a play, and it might have been handled by multiple people, but 
But the hope by police is that eventually that DNA will be linked to someone and that will give them a trail to follow to whomever might have eventually come into contact with that gun. As for my own theories about the case, I I think I sprinkled them throughout the explanation of the suspects. I, I do think that Dominic is a strong possibility because of all of the things that I've already listed, the fact that he was from Pennsylvania, that he put himself at the scene of the crime on the night of the murder, that he went on to commit an armed robbery in a very similar fashion to what happened in the Layton's house. He was wearing a similar disguise, the, you know, the all black ski mask, etc. And he was also carrying a BB gun, which is significant, I think, because the person who went into Bob and Bunny's house was carrying a gun that shot blanks. He was not carrying a real gun. In researching this case, some of the things that I was thinking about, and obviously I I don't know what the police looked into, but I wondered what television shows, what movies were being filmed in Florida around this period of time. Was there anyone who worked on any of those sets who has been connected to armed robberies since that happened? Was there anyone who abruptly left or disappeared? I also wondered about murders in the days after Amy was murdered. My thinking was that if there was a burglar left in that house by his accomplice, did he kill the accomplice? I mean, we're going on more than 20 years and no one has implicated an accomplice in this crime. And, you know, it goes back to what is at this point a cliched statement, but often seems true that two can keep a secret if one of them is dead. And especially when you are dealing with people who are drug addicts and who are committing robberies. And and that's the challenge, I think, with the Scott and Dominic case. If Scott was involved, if Dominic was involved, what are the chances that one of them wouldn't have tried to rat out the other one at some point? Or or one of them, so if we're talking about two people involved in this crime, that means not only have neither of them ever admitted to police, and by admitting, I mean, pointing the blame at their prior accomplice, but that also means they haven't told anyone else, or if they have told anyone else, it hasn't come out. And just to drop another cliche in that, the the idea that there's no honor among thieves, and you see that all the time in criminal cases, if there were a driver an accomplice to this murder out there somewhere, what happened to them? Did they end up dead as a result of leaving this intruder in the house? Or have they managed to stay quiet all these years? And that's the other challenge in a case like this. We are more than 20 years gone by now, and it is possible that the perpetrator or perpetrators is dead. Another interesting thing I saw mentioned in a Reddit thread was something about LARP or live action role play as a possibility for where someone might have used a gun that shoots blanks if it wasn't from the film industry or the theater. And although I think typically they use foam weapons rather than having a real dagger in live action role play, I could see how it might be possible that someone that's interested in doing that might also be a collector of things like ornate daggers or swords. I also noticed when I 
pulled up images of the house as well as the images that I saw in the videos, it was a pretty concealed home. The driveway curved to the side. You really couldn't see the house from the road. It had a lot of tropical trees and plants around it. The back side of the house that was located on a lagoon which fed into the river was a large backyard. So even from the water, again, it would be a stretch to see the house. You could see it, but it was concealed partially by large trees. It seemed like the lagoon space where their dock was was not very large. Other docks were in close proximity. So I thought a couple of things about that. One, you probably would not have much boat traffic into that area other than people that live in those houses. And I wondered if that would be a possible space where someone might have seen the house originally or decided to burglarize the house originally. And I also wondered, and I don't know this because I couldn't find it in any of the material I researched, but Bob and Bunny talked about how the intruder kept pacing in and out of this door. And in the 48 Hours mystery segment, it seemed like the door they were gesturing towards faced the lagoon. And I almost wondered if it was possible that he had been dropped off by a boat and not by a car. And that was why he kept walking in and out of the door on the lagoon side. And again, I don't know if he was doing that. That It just sort of appeared that way to me. That's really as far as my theories and thoughts went on the case of Amy Gellert. It is an unsolved case. If you have any information about the murder of Amy Gellert, call the Brevard County Sheriff's Office at 321-633-8413. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments or case suggestions, please send me an email at bitterendingspodcast at gmail.com. You can also find out all of the resources for this episode and read the show notes and more. Visit my website at www.bitterendingspod.com. You can also find me on Facebook at Bitter Endings Podcast. The Bitter Endings Podcast is sponsored by my fiction novels. The Northern Michigan Asylum series are novels that braid elements of haunting and murder mystery, and they're all inspired by a real former asylum here in Traverse City, Michigan, which is where I live. You can find the novels on Amazon.com in audio format if you are an Audible listener, as well as in ebook and paperback. If you enjoyed today's episode of Bitter Endings and you would like to hear more, please consider subscribing to this podcast and also leaving a review. Thanks so much and have an amazing and a safe day. I just want to take a quick minute to also acknowledge the music played in the Bitter Endings podcast. This song is called Disease Tree by Noya Sakamata.